We studied briefly in Psalm 101, the first four verses this morning, and it said a lot the same thing, that we are to present our step to God. David said, I will guard my heart. I will live perfect in my home. And then he asked him, oh God, when would you come and help me? You see, we do what we can do. We guard our hearts. We guard our minds. We fill our minds with good thoughts. We are thankful for what God has provided and the promise that he's made that he'll never leave nor forsake us. And in those times, we can always say, God, when are you going to show up? When are you going to take care of the situation? You see, we've been praying about a problem for years and it hasn't come to pass yet. God knows just how long to leave us in the furnace because he doesn't specialize in half-baked goods. He leaves you in the furnace until you're done. And then he'll take you out and put the icing on. Give your worries to God. Our prayers include thanksgiving. This is not just thanking God for what he's done, but it's to give thanks for who God is and what God has promised to do as we walk faithfully in tune with him. By faith, see how God is going to work through our lives, through our church, through our testimony, through our joyfulness, through our gentleness, through our faith, to bring others into the kingdom of God. Oh, I haven't seen a great harvest of souls here. We've seen some come to salvation since we've been here. We've had some baptized in the Holy Spirit. But nothing what I would like to see. But you see, it is God's church. It is God's timing that is important. Our thing is to be thankful for what He has done, be thankful for what He is doing, and thankful for what he's promised to do in the future. I am just, I, I don't know how to describe, describe it or explain it, but I am so thankful that God allowed me the privilege to be pastor here with you, dear people. Amen. Amen. As, you, as we work together, every week I pray every day, God, send us souls in tombstone. Yeah. Send us souls. Yeah. And friends, as we're faithful, as we rejoice, as we're thankful, and as we guard our emotions and guard our tongues, <laughs> and people see the joy of the Lord in our lives, there's going to be a harvest of souls. Yeah. Some of us may never see it. It may be some time down the road and some of us may be enjoying our heavenly uh, reward mm -hmm. at that time. But it doesn't matter. God has called us to be faithful in the area in which we are at the time we're here. Yeah. And we can rejoice yeah. and be glad in the Lord. <laughs> By faith we can see how God is going to work through our circumstances to accomplish His purpose and to bless the greatest of our people. And Paul shows us the second key to living with a lifestyle of thanksgiving. We are to renew our mind. Renew our mind. You say, well, I, I, I'd like to do that because my mind is just not what it used to be. I can't recall things. I can't, I can't uh, you know, remember things like I used to. <coughs> We'd like to renew our mind. That's not what he's talking about. Philippians 4, 8. Finally, brethren, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, Think on these things. That's what it means to renew your mind. Don't think on the economy. Don't think on 
the government. Don't think of all the problems in the world. You say, are we to forget them, just ignore them, know where to pray about them? You know, a lot of people join book clubs and they get together, they, you know, they, they read this book and they discuss what the author meant and uh, really I think I'd want to snob with myself, but that's, that's my uh, thought and that's really not what Paul said here, bring every thought into captivity. But you know, there's Christian people that get together and, and, and all they can talk about the economy or what the government should do. Or they talk about who's on the Supreme Court. You say, Christian people do that? Well, the ones I associate with a lot of times do. And they're not talking about that, they're talking about football. <laughs> Paul says, whatever is thankworthy, whatever is true, whatever is good, think on these things. You have a choice about what you're going to let consume your thoughts. Are the things in your mind true? But you see, what sort of things are true? Think on these things. Careful what you ask. <laughs> Do your thoughts lead you to thank God for your brothers and sisters in Christ? Does it lead you to praise God for the church you have to worship in? Does it lead you to thank God for those that have put their finances into this to let it become what it has become? And to just saying, well, we still need some baseboard, we still need the, the platform walls done. Yeah, we need a lot of things. But God is supplying in His time. Completely unexpected. We had a visitor not long ago. And when we left, they left a thousand dollar check in the offering. See, God supplies. Another visitor we had up from, I think it was Casa Grande, uh, visited here one Sunday. This first time we'd been to Tombstone, they was in for some deal. They came to church and liked what they saw and uh, they sent us a nice letter and a $250 check. They said, Pastor, we want to have a part in what you're doing here. God takes care of his own. Instead of crying because we don't have the money. Instead of crying because we're not a big church. Instead of crying because we don't have a, a lot of things that larger congregations have. We have one thing and that's love. One for another. Amen. Amen. We have unity. Amen. And as we begin to let God show us what we have, we can be thankful. Amen. Are your thoughts noble and right? Mm -hmm. Is what you're thinking pure mm -hmm. and lovely? Mm -hmm. <laughs> Do your thoughts lead to praise? Renew your mind. I don't know whether you've ever read the history of Napoleon, of France or not, but Leonard Griffin has given us a moving story of a political prisoner by the name of Carnap. Carnap was thrown into prison for something that uh, he had accidentally said. He had made a remark that had offended Napoleon. He really wasn't a threat to Napoleon. He really didn't, he just, you know, made a statement like we do many times about Obama. Many of us don't like him and we'll make remarks. Don't mean we're a terrorist. Don't mean we're a threat to him. Anyway, he's going in prison. He was cast into a dungeon cell and left to die. As the days and weeks and months passed, Carnet became embittered by his fate. Slowly but surely, he began to see his faith in God drift away. And one day, in a, remote, a moment of rebellious anger, he scratched on the wall of his, shell, of his cell these words, All things come by chance. Hmm. Referring to his faith because of a mark he had made. But 
there was one thing that he found as he sat in the darkness of that cell, growing more bitter day by day. There was one spot in the cell where at a certain time each day the sunlight would come through a hole or a crack somewhere and my little spot on the dungeon floor. And every day it remained just for a little while and then was gone. And one morning to his absolute surprise he saw a little green blade of a plant coming up in that spot. It was something living, something struggling up towards that shaft of sunlight. And it was his only living companion. And so he began to share what little ration of water he had with that plant. He watered it. He would uh, dig around it. He would cultivate it. He nurtured it. And that green blade became his friend. It became his teacher in a sense. And finally it burst through one day and bloomed from the little plant a beautiful purple and white flower. Once again, Carnet found himself thinking thoughts about God. And he scratched off the thing that he had scribbled on the wall of his dungeon. And in its place he wrote, God made all things. Somehow, both the guards and uh, through the guards and their wives and the gossip of the community, this little story reached the ears of Josephine, who was Napoleon's wife. She was so moved by it that she began to nag her husband. Because she was convinced that a man who loved a little flower so much could not be a threat to her husband. So Carnet was set free. And he dug out that little flower as he left his cell, put it into a pot, and nurtured it, cultivated it, that plant in the years to come. Because it's what gave him hope in the midst of despondency. He also pondered in his heart a verse that he put on that little flower pot holding the plant. And what do you think that verse would be? Let me read it to you. If God so clothed the grass of the field, which today is, and tomorrow is cast into the oven, Will he not much more clothe ye? <laughs> oh, ye of little faith. God is in control. The Bible tells that he will cause all things to work together for good to those that love him, who are called according to his purpose. 